Welcome back, Devils fans, and I am here with the Devils 2023-2024 Ultimate Season Recap and Award Show. I am your host, Ace, here on Running with the Devils. Cheers to all my Devils fans. I uh, got a little champagne for the special occasion. Today's video is sponsored by Angels and Cowboys Champagne. I made a little correction there. I made it Devils and Cowboys. Cheers to all the Devils fans. Playoff hockey is ongoing. We are not part of it, unfortunately, and I am here to recap the season that was the New Jersey Devils 23-24 season and give out my personal awards on the season. And so let's just kick it off. After last season, the 22-23 season, where the Devils set a franchise record 112 points and had a beautiful first round win over the New York Rangers in seven games. After falling in a 0-2 hole, Akira Schmid comes in, saves the day with an all-time series performance by a goaltender, putting up ridiculous numbers, getting us into the second round before we are unfortunately bounced out of there by Carolina pretty quickly. But this was a season that had so much promise. We were amongst the cup favorites heading into the season. And uh, a lot of things happened. A lot of things happened. A lot of things didn't happen. I was concerned about the goaltending after the playoffs, seeing how it ended. But Tom Fitzgerald decided to roll into the season with the tandem we had in place of Vitek Vanacek and Akira Schmid, which was not my first choice. But I assumed that when the, when the dam broke, if you will, that Tom would make a correction. That was not to come. Dougie goes down early with an injury, misses a ton of time. Injuries galore up and down the lineup. Jack, Timo, Lazar, everyone missing time. Nico, at some point of the season, combined with the league-worst goaltending for much of the season, we were relying on teenagers in Luke Hughes and Shimo Nemitz logging major minutes on the blue line. And then, obviously, we had the Team Canada thing, and Mikey McLeod gets banished. And all of these things were just too much for this team to handle. We had the first-ever Hughes Bowl where all three of the Hughes brothers played in one NHL game. And it was a long season. Fitz did nothing. He hoped and wished. We sat through a few painful press conferences of his. Lindy Ruff was fired on March 4th. And so on and so forth. We lost to bad teams all season. We went 0-2 against Anaheim. We went 1-1 against San Jose. Giving points away to bottom feeders regularly. And it all amounted to a New Jersey Devils missing of the playoffs. Golf season started April 17th, and I'm depressed, guys. I'm in depressed, and uh, when I look back at the season, as, as much as we looked out of it for a lot of the year and heading down the stretch, the teams we were chasing in the final few weeks of the season were desperately trying to give the spot away. Everyone was playing terrible, and we had false hope strung along for way too long where I believe the season was officially lost was late in the season and I believe it was officially lost starting with March 29th in Buffalo we blow a two goal lead atrocious way to end a game I was furious and that was you know the 15th time that I said it was all over on the season probably and then the next game we followed up with perhaps the most disgusting and insulting outing of the entire season blowing a two-goal third-period lead against the Pittsburgh Penguins at home. They come out like gangbusters in the third, score four unanswered to win the game and keep their playoff hopes alive at the time, which obviously ultimately fell just short for the Sidney Crosby and the Penguins as well. And then after that game was obviously the unbelievable line brawl melee game at MSG where we blew a 3-2 third-period lead at the Garden in that one to the Rangers. And then after that, we beat Ottawa on the road 4-3 to in a very close one. And then we came home and blew a 2-1 lead in the third period against Nashville before ultimately losing in the shootout, followed by blowing a two-goal mid-game lead against Toronto at home. And that is a painful stretch of six games where we earned three points instead of 12. They all should have been wins. We should have got 12 points in those six games. If you add those nine points missed out on just that stretch alone, we were right in the thick of the race. And who knows? how the other games played out. Uh, we were mathematically eliminated with like a handful of games left or whatever it was. And so I obviously believe that the team would have responded much better had the games meant something and the playoffs were still on the line, but we will never know. But that little stretch right there to me was the beginning of the end. Again, a long season for all of us. 
I pre appreciate you all for sticking with me through the year. In our first full season on the channel, had a lot of fun talking to you all. And um, Fitz now has his work cut out from heading into the summer. We all know goaltending must be addressed once and for all. I'll be coming out with a video in the next couple weeks or so of doing a deep dive on the goaltending situation. I have a lot of thoughts and ideas regarding that position. The defense must be improved, and it must get more physical. Bottom line, we had teenagers playing a majority of the season. There's a couple other guys in in the defensive core right now that I just don't see fitting well with the team moving forward. We need to get bigger. We need to get nastier. We need more experience, and we cannot have another season defensively like we did this year where we gave up grade-A chances and odd man rushes and quality chances in the slot and just leaving goalies out to dry with – you know, firing galleries coming from the other team. It was just unacceptable. And a lot of nights we left the goalie out there to be the victim of a shooting gallery. Must add some physical forwards up front. We've talked about this time and time again. We're a speedy transition team. We really have no way to cycle down low, get a sustained attack, dump and chase. Kind of not part of the devil's makeup at the moment. And a few physical forwards who could get down and dirty could really help out in that area because being a one-trick pony has not worked. The league saw tape on us. We kind of caught everyone by surprise last year. And then they realized, slow down their transition game, beat up on them, hit them, pound them, slow them down, weaken them mentally, and just continue to beat on them. And, and it's not a hard recipe to follow if you're looking to beat the New Jersey Devils. That's just you know something that the league has figured out over time. And, um, you know, it was an unfortunate it was an unfortunate end to the season. And hopefully one that the players and management both learn from going forward and that we never deal with this again. But again, thank you all for rocking with me all year long. If you're a Devils fan, I'm going to be providing all kinds of interesting content throughout the summer heading into next year. So please smash that subscribe button, like the video, comment, share, all that's fun stuff. We'll be here all summer long coming up with all kinds of interesting Devils-related content during the downtime heading into next season. So we'll see you there for that. And now, the first annual Running with the Devils Awards. And some of these categories were very interesting and kind of tough to pick for me. Um, even in a season like this, there was a lot to look back on in terms of games, plays, moments, and things that were exciting as a fan. So I'm curious to see if I get roasted for some of these picks or not. Um, but these are my awards. This is my award show, so I get to do it how I want. And so, without further ado, we will start off with the awards segment of the program, and we start off with the assist of the year. Tough one. I had a couple in my head here for this, but we start with the runner-up assist of the year, Jack Hughes to baby brother Luke. In overtime in Philly, November 30th. Check it out. Three on one. Jack Hughes accelerates. He has Luke to his right. He slides it across. And Luke Hughes scores. Hughes squared. And the Devils win it. Oh, baby. The Hughes brothers get it done quickly in overtime. What a pass from Jack. And the great speed and skating ability of his brother Luke. It lands perfectly that saucer pass after the Flyers turned it over in the Devil's zone and trying to make a play as well. Nico Heischer gets it up to Jack. And this one's a hard-fought win after the Devils had relinquished a two-goal lead late in the third. Right here, Heischer makes sure he gets it to the playmaker. Jack Hughes, he lifts that puck and watch how it lands perfectly look at luke hughes join the attack a lot of open ice bam waste no time and blows it past carter Hart. luke hughes was on the deck in the first period after taking that big hit he comes back take a bow luke he scores the game winner his second career overtime game winner we all what an amazing play by luke and jack there but jack with the nice saucer pass to get it across to him right in the wheelhouse for luke to bury it Beautiful goal, one of the more memorable plays of the season, and that is the runner-up for assist of the year and the official winner of the category. The assist of the year goes to...
Jesper Bratt to Nico Heeshear on April 3rd at the Garden against the Rangers in that melee fight-filled game. Jesper just slams on the brakes, ditches Fox, does a no-look, quick backhanded pass right through. Beautiful, beautiful pass. Beautiful, beautiful play. And, wow, it just, what a play. Let's take a look. Jesper Bratt to Captain Nico at the Garden. What a year for Bradder. That was a, such a beautiful pass. The next category for the awards, we go to the goal of the year. One of the runners-up is the Luke Hughes overtime winner I just showed in Philly. I'm not going to play it again in the interest of time. That is one of my runners-up. Jack Hughes to Luke Hughes, buries it in OT, beats the Flyers in Philly. Beautiful goal. One of the runners-up. The next runner-up, also involving Luke Hughes, where he just takes it takes matters into his own hands and goes end-to-end -end against Columbus to tie the game late at three goals apiece before we eventually win it in overtime, December 27th, at home against Columbus. Let's take a look. will regroup back in his own end as the Devils make a change with a minute 35 to play. Down a goal. Not this time here. Jack Hughes, Luke Hughes, Jesper Bratt all on the ice. Luke all the way through. He scores! Luke Hughes showing the moves there, turns the Jets on, just kind of weaves in and out of the entire team, uses the screen. Beautiful goal by Luke. Hopefully we see a long career of that, and hopefully he gets a little more sound in our own end and becomes an overall better defenseman. A great rookie season for the kid. I think he's going to be nominated for the Calder as Rookie of the Year. Unfortunately, Connor Bedard won this trophy a long time ago, and it's, you know, everyone else is just getting a nomination for the nomination. But it would be nice to see Luke get it and go to Vegas for the award show. It would be a cool a cool kind of tip of the cap for him for, for a pretty good rookie season. And then we go to the next runner-up. January 3rd at Washington. Former New Jersey Devil Mikey McLeod comes running across the rink, smashes a man on the boards, flies up the wing, waits for the pass, picks up the pass on the wing, cuts in towards the net, does a beautiful spinorama goal, unreal stuff. Rest in peace, Mikey's career, unfortunately. Here we go to Mikey McLeod at Washington, January 3rd. This, and the fact that these surges have really hurt the Devils this season uh, by, by a lot of teams. And Michael looking for a deflection from Protus that just missed him. Alexander Holtz goes the other way. 20 seconds left in the period. Flips it wide. The cloud driving. Backhand. He scores! Michael McLeod whirls it in. And the Devils are back on top. Well, a couple of things here in this sequence. It all starts prior to this line coming out. A save from Nico Dawes. A huge save. Timely save on Dowd. And then the big hit in the Devils' zone by Michael McLeod, who allowed him to jump back in the play and look at this staying with it as he spins around to the backhand nice little saucer pass from Holtz look at McLeod somehow wheels around and 
along the ice beats the goaltender, Hunter Shepard, to give the Devils the lead again. What a crazy game. What a beautiful goal by Mikey McLeod there. And along all the the long road of adversity the Devils faced this year, McLeod was another huge piece that we lost out of our lineup and was not replaced. He's obviously a face-off wizard. He's extremely tough. He brings the energy. He'll check. He'll fight if he has to. Mikey McLeod was down for anything. Overall great player, and he went down, and that's another piece that's hard to – to move on in the season with without any sort of replacement. Nothing nothing was done to replace his presence in the lineup, and that's just another one of those things on the course of the year where you just look at it and say, we obviously got extremely unlucky with a lot of the incidents that happened, but Tom Fitzgerald maybe not realizing the void he would create once he left, and, you know, maybe there could have been something done there, but unfortunately it was not, and that's just another, you know, kind of thing you point to on the year where it just all went to hell. And finally, the goal of the year. The goal of the year was a hard one for me. And maybe there's a little bias involved here because of the player involved and the type of goal that it was. You guys know I'm a ruffian. I'm an old school guy. I like the physicality. I like the displays of brute strength. I like all that stuff. But the goal of the year belongs to none other than Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Timo Meyer with the goal of the year at home against Florida on March 5th. Right off a of faceoff in the Devils offensive zone. The puck's kind of sitting there. Timo Meyer comes up and just kind of bull rushes through two guys, crushes them, kicks the puck with his skate to the backhand of his stick, and he one-hands it into the net. This is just, to me, this is just a culmination of everything. This is big body hockey. This is physicality. This is awareness. This is hand-eye coordination. This is just beautiful finishing. Unreal goal by Timo Meyer. I lost my shit watching this live when he scored. I probably did in my post-game recap video after this game as well. But here it is, Timo Meyer with the ultimate bully goal Against Florida, March 5th. Gears it toward the net, and Stolarz makes a big save. Hot screen. Hopefully we see a lot more goals like that from Timo Meyer over the next seven years. And hopefully Tom Fitzgerald brings in some other guys that are capable of beautiful goals like this. Because right now I cannot see too many other guys on our team pulling off the play that resulted in that goal. There's just too much, too much stuff going on there. And I think Timo's the only guy currently on the roster that is capable of scoring a goal in that fashion. It was an absolutely beautiful goal. Timo Meyer, deposit your apologies in the comments. You guys know who I'm talking to. And we go to the next award on the docket. The Individual Performance of the Year. And I will start off with the runner-up. The runner-up for the Individual Performance of the Year goes to... Capo Kakinen with a... 36 save shutout and a 4 0 win at the Islanders March 24th. Unreal stuff. Kakinen came in, slammed the door on the Islanders. We got outplayed for chunks of that game. And it was even more impressive because at that time we were still on life support for the playoff race. Huge road game against the Islanders. We needed the win to stay alive, kind of keep kind of keep that um, you know, life support plugged in for us. And he came out and he played a hell of a game. 36 saves and a 4-0 win for Capo Kakinen. The Devils' only shutout on the entire season. Let that sink in. 
The Devils got their first and only shutout of the entire season, roughly three weeks before the season ended, and it was Capo Kakinen, one of the two goalies brought in on deadline day, on the island, just closing the door on the Islanders and getting a big win. And I have a lot of thoughts on Capo Kakinen. That'll be in my goalie feature video as well. But we go to the winner for the individual performance of the year. And while there were several performances I was kind of weighing while looking at picking my winner for this category, there was one to me that stood above the others, and that performance belonged to. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Timo Meyer! Timo Meyer, March 7th against the St. Louis Blues, notches his first hat trick as a New Jersey Devil. Three goals, one assist, and a 4-1 win over the Blues. Again, monster game for Mr. Timo Meyer. While we are desperately trying to win hockey games and bank points in a playoff race that ultimately failed, but this is a big-time performance and a big-time moment and a big-time game for this club trying to get to the playoffs. It was not in the cards for them, but my performance of the year, a four-point night for Timo Meyer at home against the Blues, and that's that's my pick. That is my pick. There was a few other games by other players that were kind of – you know, in this category too. But to me, that was the one that that stood above the rest. And then we go to my moment of the year. There was a lot of cool, th- I don't know, not all cool, whatever, memorable things that happened throughout the season, great moments and things I'll never forget. But when looking back on the year to me, this was truly uncontested. One moment stands above the rest and that is revenge night revenge night the five on five line brawl against the new york rangers april 3rd in the garden everyone knows the backstory a quick little spark notes version february in new jersey matt rempe comes in crushes bastion on the wall questionable hit in the end i really don't think it was a dirty hit but the league doesn't want hits to the head so he ended up getting thrown out of the game for it but he crushes bastion Bastion's laid out on the ice, bleeding from his mouth. And to me, this there should be a photo, a huge, a huge photo of this in the Devil's locker room or weight room or somewhere to serve as motivation because I told you guys a while back, this is one of the images that will stick with me from the season is this photo of Bastion crumpled on the ice, bleeding after the Rempy hit. And hopefully it serves as motivation to kind of gas these guys up to do what they need to do on and off the ice and to make sure that we never have a season like this ever again. But this is powerful imagery of Nate Bastion. Part of the backstory with Rempe. And then a couple seconds after he crushed Bastion, Jonas Siegenthaler skated over like he was going to do something, which, you know, I found to be wildly entertaining. And he has to go to grab Rempe, and Rempe just hits him with a couple shots, and he just crumples to the ice in the ultimate moment of just weakness. And it was just sad. That whole exchange, I will never forget. Him, Rempe crushing Bastion and then crumpling Siegenthaler with a couple punches to the ice. Rempe gets thrown out, and the vil- the super villain is born. The New Jersey Devils super villain is born. Matt Rempe is on everyone's number one target list. And about a week or so after that game, Tom Fitzgerald, in a moment of clarity, and one of the only positive things that he did on the season, in my opinion, and obviously it was a very minor thing and not anything you know, to give him real credit for, but he realized that this team was soft and was susceptible to being battered by villains like Matt Rempe. And he goes out and he calls the Colorado Avalanche. And what does he do? He brings in the toughest man in the national, Curtis McDermott. Wow. I had been familiar with Curtis McDermott to some extent because I am an old school fan of the rough stuff. I love the fisticuffs. And so I follow this kind of thing online and I watch videos. And I had seen some videos of his of his handiwork as a member of the Avalanche and as the Kings, um, with, when he was with the Kings, of him just using his fists like the sledgehammers that they are. Using his fists like the sledgehammer they are and doling out punishment on those that need to be punished. We trade for Curtis McDermott, and a couple weeks later, we are slated to play the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. And this one, I made a whole hype video for it. I was super hyped. 
I thought we were going to see the showdown in that game. McDermott's in the lineup. Rempe's playing. Curtis McDermott chases him around a couple times, trying to, you know, instigate the fight, chopping at him a little bit, pushing on him. Rempe wants no part of the fight, whether because he, you know, was instructed not to, whatever it is. I mean, in a situation like that, I think it was it was a coward move by Laviolette and Rempe, given what happened the previous game. You need to answer the bell in that moment. I could go on for this forever, but he did not. And then later in the game, coincidentally, while McDermott was on the ice, Rempe flies across the rink and delivers the infamous chicken wing elbow to the head of Siegenthaler, victimizing Jonas Siegenthaler again. Siegenthaler crunched into the boards, laid out, hit to the face head area with the elbow. And at this point, Siegenthaler probably has nightmares about Rempe, honestly. I mean, wow. That first game, he dropped him with a couple punches. Then he gets the chicken wing elbow to the head, knocked out for some games. But uh, McDermott immediately goes after him. He was on the ice at the same time. Goes after him. The refs separate it. Rempe gets the gate thrown out of the game again. And we are robbed of revenge once again in that game. And then finally, it all just comes to a head. The beautiful crescendo of the trilogy. April 3rd at the Garden. About 20 minutes before the game, I'm watching on TV. And they announce that it's been confirmed. Matt Rempe and Curtis McDermott are both in the starting lineup, and I'm like, Psh, get my popcorn ready. My Ranger fan buddy was over. We are both jacked up, waiting for the pizza to come, having a couple beverages. And it didn't disappoint. Not only it, it delivered anything and more that I could have possibly dreamed of. We see McDermott and Rempe lined up there outside of the face-off circle. Rempe kind of postures up to get ready, and it just – Ultimate five-on-five five brawl. The puck is dropped. Lazar goes after VZ. McDermott and Rempe start going at it. Marino ends up uh, paired off with Keandre Miller, which was a complete mismatch, unfortunately, for Marino. Chris Tierney takes on Truba, and Kevin Ball was on the other side with Goudreau. Five guys throwing fists all at once. Leading up to this, I told you guys I was dreaming of a line brawl, and I said I could – Maybe it's a possibility. I didn't think it was likely whatsoever. Going back to the 2012 opening face-off line brawl, that was a three-on-three, three, and that's one of the more memorable moments for me, for a regular season anyway. Um, you know, in my fanhood, in my 30 years of being a fan, for as far as regular season moments go, that was one that I'll never forget with the three-on-three three brawl, and this surpassed it. I mean, to see five guys, and, and it definitely wasn't planned that way, I don't think. There was a couple guys – that looked like they were trying to get into it right away. But if you look, the last two fights that kind of broke away happened a good chunk of time after the first ones did. Completely surreal stuff. Probably the biggest single moment, I think, in terms of you know social media hype and whatever for the league on the year. I mean, it was talked about on every sports show. It was talked about on news shows. It was talked about by people on every platform that don't even really talk about sports at all. It was... That moment kind of blew up and expanded way beyond hockey and sports, and it was kind of like a mainstream news kind of story. It was beautiful to see the Devils finally grew a backbone, to see them um, you know, stick up for themselves, stick up for their teammates. It was a beautiful thing to see. You see the four guys in the box there waiting their fate before they ultimately all got tossed except for Curtis Lazar, everyone else gets the gate. Eight guys, four four guys per side thrown out in the first two seconds of a game. Completely unreal stuff. What a moment on the season. And, um, you know, it, wow. I mean, just wow. I've watched it so many times. It never gets old. The McDermott-Rempe portion of the fight seemed to be a marathon. I think it was well over a minute and a half of real time, which is a set, which is eternity in a hockey fight. I mean, you just don't see fights go on for that long but it was a beautiful thing to see moment of the year the five on five line brawl at the garden against the rangers and there's not even a close a close mention so i didn't even bother going with any runners up here we go to the next category the game of the year i feel similarly about this one to me this was a clear-cut very easy decision uncontested category the game of the year Devils against the Philadelphia Flyers, February 17th at MetLife Stadium, home of the New York Giants and New York Jets, in the shadows of our former arena, the Brendan Byrne Arena slash Continental Airlines Arena. 
Beautiful day out there all day, barbecuing, drinking, bullshitting with Devils fans. Completely nostalgic, just amazing atmosphere to be a part of. The league should do more of these. I'm hoping the Devils um, get more of these sometime soon. You know, we didn't have one for about 10 years. The first one being a disastrous loss to the Rangers at Yankee Stadium. But this one, which was also, if I look back on it, I still had a good time. But to me, this one was something something really special because it was in our home state. We were the, the Devils were the main draw. We're right there near our former arena in the parking lot. Everyone tailgating, everyone having a great time. It was just nostalgia overload. A day I'll never forget. Friends and family out there were just eating, drinking, great times. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that we don't see more of these. But the stadium series at MetLife also brought us one of the best pregame lineup reads by former New Jersey Devil P.K. Subban. And let's go to P.K. with the starting lineup. How about those Devils? How about those Devils? I don't need this coach. I'm good. Can I get a ski yee? Let's start with the head coach. He's buff. He's tough. He's Lindy Ruff. He's pretty, and he lives in Jersey City, number 13, Nico Hishauza. He may be swingless, but damn, he can finish. Yes, for Brett, Tin Attack, where my boy at? He's long, strong, and down to get the defense on, Lucas Hughes. He ain't Dan Marino, but he likes to sip on Pellegrino, John Marino, baby. He's got two cups. And that's a lot, Andre Pilat. He breaks laws and maybe Jaws. Kicking him in that Nico Dawes. Let's go, baby. Let's go, boys. Have a good one. Enjoy the moment. I love you guys. Have fun. You guys know there's portions of that that I will make sure live on forever. Nico, he shouza, will live on this channel for eternity. For eternity, PK Subban giving us one of the greatest sound bites of all time and 32 seconds into the game nico he sure gets on the board beautiful breakaway goal giving the devils the one nothing lead go on to win the game six to three great atmosphere in the crowd luckily i had the little mezzanine club so in between periods i could kind of thaw off a little bit before braving back out into the cold for the next period great time great atmosphere i'm still mad about the messier kind of trolling video they showed on the scoreboard i thought that was kind of weird um, they, they had a reference. He was referring to the 1994 Eastern Conference Final Series, which I thought was total BS um, at a Devils game to, to have that video package, which is it's still kind of messed up. I just remember that right now. But um, screw you, Messier. And there's only one way to describe the overall evening at MetLife Stadium. Uh, thanks for showing up. It was fucking amazing. Sorry. <laughs> we move to the next category. The celebration or Selly of the year. And the runner up for Selly of the year is. The Luke Hughes bow in Philadelphia after potting the overtime winner. Luke skates up the wing and does a little victory bow to the crowd and to everyone in attendance. Great Selly and would have one Selly of the year, if not for the winner of the category. And the winner of Selly of the Year. It could only be one. My man, Nasty Nate. Nate Bastion hitting the Tommy Cutlets at MetLife Stadium, home of the New York football giants and Tommy DeVito. Unbelievable in the moment, Selly. Beautiful stuff, all tying back to our game of the year. But Nate Bastion, after scoring a goal, Doing the cutlets in the home of the Giants is our, or my, Selly of the Year. And now we move on to the Player Awards. Ooh, the Player Awards. We're going to start off with Most Improved. And this one's kind of hard because I wasn't going Most Improved within the season. I'm going Most Improved from this season to last and there wasn't, like, a, a clear-cut winner, I don't think. But for most improved. I'm 
messing shit up over here. I'm going with my man Alexander Holtz. Alexander Holtz had four points in 19 games played in the 22-23 season. He played all 82 games this season while being in the doghouse for a lot of it. He had 28 points this year, limited ice time, limited role. But Holtz looked like he took that next step to me this season. I think a lot of people had super high expectations of him coming off of last year, but I think he took that next step in the natural progression to be a great NHL player. And hopefully he takes the next step even further next year with increased ice time and better line mates. And we'll see what he could do. You know, the team, the coaching staff and management have kind of honed in on the little things that, that he does or doesn't do that bother him. And hopefully he could figure it out and hopefully he's not traded. I mean, if it comes down to it and we have to trade him to get a mega piece, then so be it. But I would like to see him stay with the team and be part of the core for years to come, because I think he is going to be a very good player in this league, whether it's here or somewhere else. And before I get to the next category, I want to kind of talk about that for a second. Um, this wasn't planned either, but I'm just kind of – my mind's kind of bouncing everywhere. I think a lot of the fans need to have realistic expectations in terms of trades and when trading young players. And and what I mean by that is, um, you know, guys get dealt in, in deals that – management i guess would look at as extraneous pieces at the time they're traded and then these guys go on to other teams and kind of have breakout years and then our fans are like see i told you you know you're the fitzgerald's an idiot for trading him like look what he's doing now and again you guys know i am not a fan of fitzgerald whatsoever but i will say i want to talk about some 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 deals specifically um i'm gonna start i'm gonna start with the team of meyer deal uh, you guys know I love Timo. I think he's going to be a, a huge piece of this team's success moving forward for the next seven years, and I would do that deal again um, tomorrow if I could go back in time. I'm doing the deal to trade for Timo. I'm doing the deal to lock him up long term. I have no qualms or reservations about any of that. With that being said, a lot of people are like, oh, look at Zetterlin. See, look what Zetterlin's doing, yada, yada. And again, I think it's it's cheesy to me when people kind of use hindsight to go after somebody for something that they may not have disagreed with at the time. It's kind of hard to explain, but I think there was a lot of people, I, I think, that were unhappy with the deal for Timo to begin with. But I think, by and large, most people thought it was a good idea, which I don't – you know, we weren't losing any main pieces, and you're bringing in a guy like Timo Meyer. Anyone with half a brain should have been on board for that deal. With that being said, Zetterland was never going to do – what he's doing in San Jose here. That that's what people need to realize, guys. We had a we had we had and have a lot of forwards. So when you have a guy like Zetterlin that's buried down the depth chart, he's not gonna get a lot of ice time or produce a lot here. He just has to leapfrog too many people. It's not gonna happen. And so when he goes to San Jose on a team that doesn't have nearly as much talent. And he gets more ice time and more opportunity and plays with better players. He should score more points. He's obviously a pretty good player. He's in the NHL. The NHL is the best league in the world. I repeat, the National Hockey League is the best hockey league on the planet. And so if you take any player, Zetterlund aside, any player, any player in the league who gets traded from one team to another and plays way more minutes and may get some power play time and play with better line mates – you should produce more. That's only logical. And so I think fans need to take a step back and realize that some of these guys were never going to have the seasons they're having now on other teams with the Devils because of the circumstances here, with the depth that we have. They weren't going to get these opportunities. They weren't going to play top six minutes. They weren't going to get power play time. They weren't going to get all of these things. And so I can't get mad when I see guys move on and do well. I think people – want to see every trade be some sort of robbery where the guy goes to another team and then he goes there to die and you never hear from him again. That's not going to happen, guys. They're NHL players. They're going to go other places and do well. And aside from Zetterland, a lot of people have brought up the Sharon Govich to Foley trade. And the reality is I was super on board for that trade when it happened. And why was that? Because to me and anyone, again, with half a brain, Trading for Tyler Toffoli is a win-now move. You are not trading for Tyler Toffoli to talk about the future is bright and the window's just opening. When you cash in a kid like Sharon Govich 
and you bring in Toffoli, that's like, we want to contend for the Cup now or in the next couple of years. I honestly believe the plan was we were going to make the playoffs this year, go on a nice run, and then sign Toffoli for however many years and have him as part of the group that's going to keep pushing that until eventually we get a Stanley Cup. The season completely imploded on us, and then Toffoli got sold off for scraps, and now when you look back at it, the deal's terrible, and I can't argue that. But the reality is Sharon Govich was never going to do what he's doing in Calgary or what he did in Calgary this season. He was never going to do that in a devil's jersey, guys, and that's what you have to realize, and that's okay. But a lot of you get caught up in the FOMO. It's like, oh, if we, if we didn't trade him, we would have him here doing that. He was never doing that. He was never going to do that here. There's just too many guys ahead of him in the depth chart, and he wasn't going to get the chance. You could blame coaches for that or whatever you want, but, you know, he he kind of played up and down the lineup at different times. I always believed in Sharon Govich, and I thought he would be a good player for us down the line. Or if he got traded, I told people, I think, in an increased role, he could be a very good player for another team. I wouldn't have guessed he would have done as well as he did this year, but I thought for sure he'd easily be at least a 50-point player. He's doing well in an increased role in another city, and that's just part of the game. And you can't really, you know, go back and with hindsight be like, oh, that trade was terrible because I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest about it. I go, if I could go back in time, obviously without, without knowing how this season ended, but I would do that deal for Toffoli again. I am always, I am, I am a fan from back in the day and my views and whatever are kind of skewed by the Lou Lamarillo school of everything because as a fan, I saw three Stanley Cups. Lou tried to win every year. I don't care about futures to, for the most part, and prospects and all these things are nice, but in the end, I always want to see those type of pieces traded for win-now pieces if you have a good nucleus or kind of foundation to build on, and the foundation's been here. Jack Hughes, Nico Heischer, Dougie Hamilton, Jesper Bratt, we have the pieces. Now, now Timo Meyer. the pieces are here, and so we need to bring in these depth forwards, Hopefully physical defenseman and find a way to tweak the roster to go on a run. But I just wanted – that was my little tangent about players being traded because I have seen tons of comments recently of people just, you know, wanting to complain about every trade ever made and talking about how good these players are doing in other cities, and it's it's just not an apples-to-apples apples comparison. The next category on the players' award list, the unsung hero of the season. And the unsung hero of the year goes to Curtis Lazar. Curtis Lazar is the absolute man. I've said for a few months now how he's quickly becoming one of my favorite players on the team. Seven goals, 18 assists, 25 points, and 71 games played with a team high plus 10 in the plus minus category. One of only three forwards and one of only five players on the entire team to finish in the plus. Curtis McDermott was a plus four. Chris Tierney a plus three. DeSimone plus three. And Ball a plus one. Curtis Lazar leading the team with a plus ten. Block shots, hits, will fight when necessary. He was the first man in to, to get the gloves off and get it in at the garden when he tackled VC and then the little scrap. Guy does it all. Seems to be a great teammate. Seems to be a great influence in the room. Great personality. Curtis Lazar is the absolute man. His stock has shot through the ceiling with me personally over the course this year. I absolutely love the guy. Had some funny moments captured with Curtis Lazar at Locker Cleanout Day. If you haven't seen the Locker Cleanout Day video, check that out on the channel. That went up a couple days ago. Lazar might be the star of the show on there. And uh, there's not much more to say. Look forward to Curtis Lazar, and hopefully we can get a couple a couple more guys, maybe with a little more offensive upside, but a couple other heart and soul guys like him to round out the bottom six because we need it. And and if this playoffs so far in the, sh in the young two days of playoffs we've had, one thing that's been on display is brute physicality and depth. Fourth lines are getting it done on the score sheet, hitting, setting the tone, Momentum swings, fourth line is huge, and I think it's kind of been lost on some teams over the years. But the playoffs already, this is day two of the playoffs, have shown that this this matters. This really matters, and then we go to the most valuable player. 
The 23-24 Running with the Devils, New Jersey Devils MVP award goes to. This one wasn't that hard. Jesper Bratt. Jesper Bratt, the Bratter. 27 goals, 56 assists, 83 points in 82 games played. A new career high for Bratt. Over a point per game player. Congratulations to Jesper Bratt. A big season after signing that deal. And um, he's been probably our most consistent player over the past few years. He had 73 points in 82 games played last year. So that's now two years in a row he's played all 82. Most players can't say that. And then he had 73 points in 76 games played in the 21-22 season. The last three seasons, he has 229 points in 240 games played. That is .954 points a game. A hair under a point per game player over the last three seasons. Jesper Bratt. It's time for people to start giving him his flowers. He deserves it, and he, at this juncture, I, I mean, he probably is our most reliable forward. You know, don't, no disrespect to Jack Hughes, but, you know, he hasn't been able to stay in the lineup like this. Jesper Bratt, 229 points in 240 games played over the last three years. Unreal stuff from Jesper Bratt. Look forward to seeing him kind of step it up next year and see what we could do and hopefully return to the playoffs and go on a run. It's a shame that, you know, guys like this are at home watching the playoffs and not playing in them. It's a real shame. And hopefully this all ignites them to, to be better. And the next award, the final award, actually, the next and final award, guys, I would most like to hit the bar with. And I had to pick two. I couldn't just pick one. But. Guys, I would most like to hit the bar with are Curtis Lazar and Curtis McDermott. The two Curtises, one with a C, one with a K. Absolutely love both of these guys. They're both kind of throwback players. Heart and soul, locker room guys, give it all on the ice, do their job well, know their role, make other players feel more, more comfortable. And the Curtises. With the C and with the K, Lazar and McDermott, love them both. They are the two guys I would most like to hit the bar with and have some beverages. Huge fans of both of them. And they both climbed up the ladder for me of amongst my favorite players throughout the year. And I already gave my kind of little spiel on Curtis Lazar. I'm a big fan of the block shots and the hits, the most underappreciated stats in all of hockey. And um, they're actually qu pretty hard to, to look up. That's how underappreciated they are. You can't readily look up stats for players on block shots and hits. It's very hard. The NHL needs to kind of wake up on things like this as well. I mean, certain stats shouldn't be buried. Like, they're, it's hard to find. Underappreciated stat, stats of a winner. They're the stats of a team or player's willingness to win. Block shots and hits. Tells the story. Curtis Lazar excels in both. And then, obviously, Curtis McDermott, the toughest man in the national. You guys already know what I think about him. Absolute legend. He became a franchise legend shortly after getting here, giving Rempe that much-needed beating, even though I wish it was a little bit worse. he, he McDermott got an easy W, and he pounded him up a little bit. His lips is all bloody and, and, and bruised up. But let me – Curtis is – either Curtis or both of you, let me know when you guys want to hit the bar. Drinks on me. And um, that concludes the first annual Running with the Devils award show. And in closing, guys, you know, Fitz has a lot of work to do. Fitz has a lot of work to do this summer in no particular order. We all know goaltending was atrocious all year. He hoped and wished, sat by idly and did nothing. One of our best defensemen, Dougie Hamilton, went down. We relied on teenagers, and he did nothing to kind of help out the blue line. And we need to get tougher as a team. We need to get tougher as a team. It was somewhat reassuring that Fitz mentioned this at his end-of-season press conference, but him acknowledging that it's a problem and him, him doing something to fix it are two wildly different things. He acknowledged months ago that goaltending was a problem, and he continued to hope and wish and did nothing about it until deadline day when it was seemingly too late, and then he brings in two goaltenders. Stuff that really makes you scratch your head and wonder what the hell's really going on here. Are we living in the twilight zone or, you know, what exactly, who's running the asylum? But 
it it was somewhat nice to hear him acknowledge the fact that he realizes physicality is part of the game. The guys need to hit the weight room. They need to get bigger. They need to get stronger. They need to get nastier. They need to be more comfortable with confrontation. These are all things that he said that I thought were good, but I have no faith in him to actually now go out and do the things to properly address these things. But nonetheless, it was nice to hear him say it. And the defense. The defense just needs to be shored up. We need some vets back there. We can't have kids exposed. Um... And the goaltending's got to get better as well. I don't know whether that means, you know, a marquee name, household name that everyone's familiar with. I think there are some more budget versions of number one goalies that could be had that may have not traditionally been a number one goalie. And I'm, I'm going to go into a whole deep a deep goalie situation video. But, um, yeah, we need to get better in every position, honestly. Goaltending needs to be improved. Defense needs to be improved. And we definitely need some nasty, grinder, gritty, playoff type performing forwards and you see it here in the rangers game i was watching a little while ago matt rempe our super villain scored the opening goal for the rangers i mean fourth lines matter you need depth you need all this and i've been saying it all year you need depth you need physicality you need intensity when the playoffs come you are not going to win being a, a speed skating figure skating soft team you're just not that first period of the bruins maple leafs game one last night was one of the most vicious periods of hockey I've ever seen. I believe there was 48 hits in the first period, or 40 hits, whatever it was. Completely brutal. If the Devils were out there against either one of those teams, we would have been leaving on stretchers. Tons of guys would have been knocked out of the game. They were, they're playing for keeps, and this is for the Cup. Because it's the Cup. Those are some of the greatest commercials, if you guys remember back in the day, the Because It's the Cup commercials. You should check those out on YouTube if you haven't seen them. Look it up because it's the cup. Some great commercials from years ago. But in closing, I am dejected. I am sad. I am depressed. The Devils are a significant portion of my life, and our season is over. I will be here with you guys throughout the summer leading up into next season with all types of off-season content of all kinds, different you know, series I'm going to try to work on. But – Fitzgerald has his work cut out to do, and hopefully he takes it serious and he makes the moves. And the <laughs> the number one initiative on his calendar – the number one initiative on his calendar should be bringing his cousin here, Brady Kachuk from the Ottawa Senators. I am going to talk about this in almost every video I make going forward. It makes all the sense in the world. Brady Kachuk is the exact guy we need. He brings exactly what we don't have. Grit, tenacity, balls, fight, heart, willing to win. Guy does it all. If you watched the last game we played against the Senators, he set an NHL record with 16 hits against us in one night. You guys all know I love the rough stuff. Not for no reason. Not because I'm a barbarian, but because it matters. Yes, and it is, it is entertaining as hell as well. But you need this. You need this in your team's DNA to win the Stanley Cup. The playoffs are unforgiving. Everything's intensity is increased. Teams are out there looking to crunch you at every chance they get. And it's a it's a battle of wills. And guys like Brady Kachuk are foxhole type guys. Those are guys, the type of guy you want in the foxhole with you when it comes to playoff war. And they just don't make him like him anymore. Honestly, to me, it's him and his brother. Matthew Kachuk, their throwbacks, NHL pedigree. Their father, Keith Kachuk, was an absolute animal. His kids are animals. And there's not many guys out there like them anymore at all. And they could do it all. Score, pass, fight, hit, whatever you want. The Kachuk brothers are down. Brady Kachuk is a special talent. He's Tom Fitzgerald's cousin. And hopefully he finds a way to bring him here this offseason. I don't even want to wait. Make it happen this summer, Fitz. Bring Brady Kachuk here. He has everything we need. He will ignite the team. He will ignite the fans. And hopefully he's here to, to hoist a Stanley Cup with this New Jersey Devils club. Went over a lot here today. Didn't want to keep you guys this long. It was just a lot to cover. So inevitably on the season wrap-up and award show, it was quite a long video here. But thank you for sticking with me throughout. If you did, let me know in the comments what you thought about anything th from throughout the entire season. Let me know if you have any issue with any of my picks, anything I may have forgotten, anything and everything New Jersey Devils hockey. You guys already know what time it is. Throw it out there in the comments. I love talking to you all. 
it's going to be a long and painful offseason. Watching these playoff games are bittersweet. I wish our boys were in the tournament, but they are not. And so I will continue talking about whatever Devils stuff comes up along the way and probably some random playoff videos here and there. But talk to you all in the comments. Give me your thoughts. Give me everything. And um, that's it, guys. Wrapping it up here. Talk to you all soon. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Until next time, friends, let's go Devils.